Larry Allison. Tonight we're going to talk about how to move from the pit to the palace. Would you like to get out of the pit and just kind of like move into the palace? It's about time, don't you think? All right. Lift up the word and repeat after me. I believe this is the word of God. I believe what God says because it is impossible for God to lie. God's not going to lie to you. He's never going to lie to you. How many times has God lied to you? How many times has God lied to you? Never. God is not a liar. Turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 16, verse 25. It's a scripture that we look at often. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Acts chapter 16, verse 25. It's one of my favorite stories. It's about Paul and Silas, about how they were in prison. You might say they were in the pit. Has anybody in their life ever been in the pit? All right. How many of you have ever been out of the pit? All right. It's out of the pit is better than in the pit. Amen. Just, just in case you're curious. It's, it's nicer, easier, more comfortable. It even smells better to be in the palace than to be in the pit. All right. Paul and Silas were in the pit, Acts 16, 25. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. I think it's so important that we've got to understand one of the keys to getting out of the pit is we've got to understand that when you're in the pit, you cannot have a pity party. <laughs> See, in the pit, it's tempting to have a pity party. So uh, Paul and Silas, well, it wasn't such a bad day. I mean, other than the fact that they were beaten. And the kind of beating that was done back then was not the kind of beating that uh, is done today. I mean, today, today, people in other countries desire to come to the United States and be thrown into jail. Because jails in the United States are better than many public officials live in in third world countries. But the reality is the kind of jail that Paul and Silas was in was not nice. It was the inner prison. It didn't have hard floors. It had, actually what it had for a floor was manure. And they had chains on them. They were in stocks. The kind of stocks that the Romans had were not the kind like you see in the movies where they put their little hands through and their head and somebody throws a pie at them. Wasn't that kind of stocks. They were, they were ankle stocks. And what the soldiers would do is they would stretch their legs so far apart and they had this bar that went between their two ankles that many times, much of the time, any time a prisoner had stocks put on them, they would never walk again if they were in the stocks any time at all because it would break their hips, break joints. It was, it was not pleasant. They didn't have uh, piped-in air conditioning. They didn't have piped-in satellite radio. At midnight in the prison was a pretty bad time. The soldiers, I was watching on the History Channel just a couple of days ago in the hotel, late at night. It's the only thing safe to watch late at night in the hotel is the History Channel. And uh, so Loretta and I were watching the History Channel and they were talking about some of these things. Uh, the Roman soldiers, the Roman soldiers were not nice. For fun, I mean, they would just go in and torture prisoners just randomly for fun. So when Paul and Silas were in prison at midnight and they were praying and singing hymns of praise to God, that was an unusual situation. And what happened while they were praying and singing hymns to God, the very next phrase says, and all the prisoners were listening. Now what does that mean? That means 
that when Paul and Silas were in a position to have a pity party, that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? When Paul and Silas were in a position to have a pity party, instead of having a pity party, they had a praise marathon. And that was unusual because probably everybody else in the prison was having a pity party all the time. It was probably not rare, it was probably never that anybody praised God, sang hymns, and prayed in prison. Probably never. So when they shifted out of what was expected, the pity party mode, that was what was expected. But when they decided not to go there, they decided to go to the praise and singing place, the prisoners listened to them. And what that does is that establishes a place that God can work in. It creates an atmosphere for a miracle to take place. Now some people wonder why a miracle doesn't take place in their life. And part of the reason is because they haven't prepared the atmosphere for a miracle. Atmosphere is important. Scott, atmosphere is very important. If you're going to uh, take your wife out of town for a couple of days and you want to be romantic, the last thing in the world you want to do is take her out to the tick and flea bed and breakfast. <laughs> Some place has got a partial screened in porch with no air conditioning. Hey, let me tell you what. You want romance? Let me tell you what to do to get romance. You go to a nice place. Just break down and spend an extra three dollars and seventy-five cents. You know, get a rose. Put it in a vase. Put some music on in the background. Light a couple of candles. Get a hotel that's got cold and hot running water. <laughs> you know, you know what I'm saying. You you can create an atmosphere for fun, or you can create an atmosphere for stress and distress in your life. And most of us don't realize it, but we're creating the atmosphere for victory or failure on a regular basis. We create that atmosphere many times with our words. When we, when we say that we are going to fail, when we say that everything is going wrong, when we say we will never make it, when we say that there is no way in the world this is ever going to work out, when we finally reach the point that we make those statements, most of the time we get what we say. Because the seeds we are planting, we have planted them into soil that is ready to receive those seeds. But Paul and Silas were not planting seeds of failure or death. The scripture tells us, I place before you life and death. Please choose life. The word says, death and life are in the power of your tongue. Jesus made this real interesting statement. And to this day, I know very few ministers that can even grasp what Jesus said in this statement. Jesus said, by your words, you will be justified. Now, he said, watch what you say. He said, you'll be held accountable for your idle words. But then his very next statement is this. Listen, he said, by your words, you will be justified. And by your words, you will be condemned. So your words, what comes out of your mouth, creates the atmosphere for what's going to happen around you. Paul and Silas were creating an atmosphere so that they could move out of the pit. Now, if you want to move into the palace, let, let me give you a clue. In order to get into the palace, the first step is get out of the pit. Now, I know that sounds elementary, but in order to move into the palace, you've got to get out of the pit. And most people are focusing on the palace and it's good to have a vision. It's good to have a plan. But they're so focused 
on the palace that they're not focused on getting the atmosphere right in the pit so they can get out of it. It says, but at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. If you, while you're in the pit, will create an atmosphere for a miracle with your words, other people will observe what's going on with you. They may think that you're not really having both oars in the water. However, they will admire you and they will want what you have. And many times they will be set free because they've just been close to somebody who's victorious. See, the scripture tells us that we can be influenced, that we can, we can have prosperity partially by who we hang around with. Well, the Word of God says it this way. He who hangs around with a fool will be a fool. So I guess the, if you can look at what it says, let's look at what it doesn't say. He who doesn't hang around with a fool will not be a fool. Okay? So associations, our associations make a difference in the outcome in our life. The prisoners who were blessed enough, some people would say lucky enough, but these, these guys were blessed enough to be in the cell next to Paul and Silas just because of their location. They got set free. And you know what? There needs to be people that will have their lives set free just because they know you. You should be such a light and such an influence that on the job, in the workplace, not just at church, but everywhere, at the bank, at the store, at the office, at the real estate office, at, at the hair office, at, you know, at the car shop, every place, every place. We should be such an influence that everyone around us benefits because they're close to us. Verse 26 says, suddenly there was a great earthquake. Now, can I tell you this? A lot of people are believing for something to happen suddenly. But up until suddenly happened, it didn't seem too suddenly. Five minutes before the suddenly, <laughs> it wasn't too cool. They were still laying there in the filth, legs in the stocks, beat, they were whipped, the scripture says, bloody backs, laying in sewage, not a pretty sight, not, not too exciting. And they were singing hymns and praising God. And just before, listen to this, just before the earthquake, there wasn't an earthquake. So just before the suddenly, it would have been real easy for them to give up, wouldn't you say? Because just before the suddenly, the suddenly hadn't happened yet. See, I really think that there's a lot of people and I know what's happened with me in the past, I have not benefited from something even though I was doing what was right because I gave up just before the suddenly happened. The suddenly was right around the corner. The suddenly was just about to break through. But just before the suddenly, I walked away. And I think that too many Christians are not enduring to the end. Now, the scripture says, he who endures to the end will be saved. That's not talking about eternal life. That's talking about the type of salvation that comes in life. He who endures to the end. To the end of what? To the end of the bad stuff just before the suddenly. Oh, when's the suddenly going to come? When it's there. How do you know when it's there? You don't know it's there till it's there. When should I give up? Never. All right, suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately, how many doors were opened? All the doors were opened. All the doors were opened. And it says, and blank chains were loosed. What, what fits in that blank there? And everyone's chains were loosed. You mean even the ones who weren't singing? Yeah. 
even the ones who weren't singing. Why? They were close to the ones who were. It is extremely important that we associate with godly people. People will say, I, I have young people say this to me on a regular basis. Well, it really doesn't matter who I hang around with as long as, as, long as I'm okay. Well, now, to an extent, to an extent, they're right. To an extent. But the reality is this. If you keep hanging around the people of Sodom, eventually you'll live there. And that's what happened in the Bible. See, we, we need to take young people and older people, and we need to have this conviction in our mind that we are going to seek after the things of God. Now, we're not to be isolated from the world because we still need to go into the world on a daily basis. We may be in the world, but we're not of the world. Just because the Israelis went into Lebanon did not make them Lebanese. But they went in, did what they needed to do, and left. They were Israelis before they went in, they were Israelis when they went in, and they were Israelis when they came out. You may need to go into the world. You're a Christian before you go into the world, you're a Christian while you're in the world, and you're a Christian when you come back out. Jesus said that we would be in the world, but we're not of the world. We shouldn't be isolated from the world, but we should be insulated from the world. So suddenly was a point of time. Now, now think about this. Suddenly was a point of time. And you need to understand this. Before suddenly, it wasn't suddenly. How can I know God's timing for my life? Well, let me tell you this. Nothing in your life will be right outside of God's timing. We started this church 12 years ago. Countless times I've had people say to me, why didn't you start this church before then? You could have. Well, the reality is that's true. We could have, but it would not have been God's timing. See, you can do things too late, but you can also do things too early. When Jesus was here on the earth, he spent 30 years of his life before he was anointed of the Holy Spirit when he was baptized. And then he spent three to three and a half years ministering here on the earth. Now, how would it have been if John the Baptist would have come up to him and said, hey, why in the world? You're just down here for 33 years. Why did you wait till you were 30? My goodness, man, you could have started at 23 and had a 10-year jump start on this thing. If you've done this much in three years, think what you could have done in 13. The re why? Why didn't Jesus start earlier? Because God had a timing. God had a time, a moed, an appointed time for Jesus to do what Jesus was supposed to do. And your ministry may not start until you're 78 years old. And it may last six months. But if your ministry is supposed to start when you're 78 years old and it's going to last six months, and you do what God tells you to do, you will accomplish more under God's anointing in that six months at 78 than you would have ever accomplished starting out at 16 and working to your 78 under your own power. With the anointing of God, you will be able to complete and have fulfillment in everything that you're supposed to do. But timing is important. I've shared this before many times, God's told me to go over there. And I'll hear God tell me to go over there. And I'll hear God say, go over there. And I get over here, and then I hear him say, tomorrow. <laughs> See, and then you're over here like a day early. It doesn't work. Because you can't do today where you are if God's wanting you to do where you are tomorrow. All right. Time is created. It's a created item. See, God doesn't live in time. God lives in eternity. God carved out in eternity a substance called time, and he placed man within time. The Bible tells us 
This is why God calls himself I am. He never calls himself I was, never calls himself I will be. He is I am. And he is I am now. 2,000 years ago he was I am. 4,000 years ago he, is, he was I am. He will always be I am because God can insert himself into time wherever he wants to because time is created. Man is confined to time now. But the scripture tells us that just like before time was eternity, after time there will be eternity. You know, the scripture says there will be a time when time will be no more. And we will no longer measure time because time will be a non-existent entity. There will not be a time-space continuum because time will not exist. But now, where we are, God has placed us within time, and he has given us things to do in his timing. If you want to get out of the pit and move into the palace, the first thing to do is get out of the pit. And when you're in the pit, as long as you create an atmosphere for defeat, you will stay in the pit. So the first thing that a person needs to do is create an atmosphere for deliverance. You do that by saying the right things, by praising God, by walking by faith instead of by sight. You believe what he told you instead of believing what you see. See, I truly believe Paul and Silas did not see themselves in the pit. They saw themselves delivered. They saw themselves set free. In our way of thinking, there's natural predetermined time. We think in terms of uh, the sun comes up and the sun goes down. A child is conceived and then a child is born. A child is born, then the child grows up and dies. We, we think of everything as a beginning and an end. A race starts and then the race finishes. The song starts, the song finishes. You throw the ball, the, the ball starts moving through space. Somebody either catches it or they don't and the, the ball stops, there's a start and stop. And we're so geared to thinking that way that we can't think in terms of the way God thinks. See, God saw Paul and Silas delivered while they were in the pit. We need to see ourselves the way God sees us. When we have a need and we go to God with our need, and it seems like nothing happens, we start saying things, we shouldn't, but we start saying things like, where's God? And we start questioning God. See, when you do this, when you say, well, where, where's God? Where's the power? Why haven't I been delivered? I've been tithing and I'm still broke. I've been confessing the healing scriptures and the doctor says I'm still sick. I've been believing that the children are righteous will be delivered and my children are still idiots. Why is it that the scriptures are not working for me? And when you say that, now, now follow me through on this. When you say that, the very fact that you say it, no, now, now listen, I want you to understand this. The word of God says in John 3, 17 that Jesus did not come into the world to condemn the world. There's a difference between condemnation and conviction. And what I'm going to tell you is a statement that immediately, as soon as it comes out of my mouth, the enemy will try to make you condemned when you hear it. All right? Are you listening to me? But this is not to condemn you or me. This is to convict us so that we can correct it. This is what teaching does. All right? Now, the very fact that a person would say, why hasn't it happened, is proof that there's not total faith that it would happen. Let 
Can, can you wrap yourself around that for a moment? If you ask why hasn't it happened, then obviously you weren't in total faith in God that what he promised would come through. The Word of God says that if, listen to what Jesus said. You've heard me say this a thousand times. Now it's going to be a thousand and one, all right? Jesus said in Mark eleven twenty three, he said, and I say this to you, if you say to that mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and you don't doubt in your heart, but but you believe that those things you say will come to pass, then you will have whatever you say. Now, that's a straight quote from Jesus. Now, we've got to ask ourselves this question. Did Jesus tell the truth? Is that statement true? Is it true? I mean, if it's not true, then Jesus lied. So what he said there must be true. Now, if it's true, it is. But if it's true, then here's some things we're going to have to analyze. If we're speaking to the mountain and the mountain has not moved, then one of, I think, three conditions is going to have to exist. Either Jesus lied and it doesn't work, or we've spoken to it improperly, we've, we've done something wrong. It, it does work, but we've done something wrong. Or the third possibility is we've done it all right and it just hasn't happened yet. Are you following me? So I believe that Paul and Silas knew when they were in prison, they spoke to the mountain. What they did is they spoke to the mountain, to the kingdom, to the kingdom of darkness that had come against them. And in spite of the way things looked, in spite of what they heard, smelled, and saw, they believed what God said above and beyond what they saw. They were walking by faith, believing in him, instead of walking by what they saw. And then they got what he said. Now, what did, what did God say? Well, Paul and Silas, the New Testament hadn't been written yet. So the scriptures that they had were Old Testament scriptures. They had this scripture, no weapon formed against you will prosper. They could have stood on that. No weapon formed against you will prosper. So they believed that. And if, if they truly believed it, then why get stressed? Did they believe what Jesus said? Jesus said that no condition, no test, no trial, no tribulation could come against us. That's what he said in his word. Paul, who received it from the Holy Spirit, later wrote it down. He said there's no test, trial, or tribulation that can come against us except that God the Father, by way of his Holy Spirit, empowers us with the power to withstand it. it. Listen, there's nothing that can come against you that you and Jesus cannot overcome. And part of the key is, is when you're in the pit, you can't say pity party things. When you're in the pit, now... You, you don't live in denial. You know what denial is. It's a river in Egypt. But other than that, <laughs> den denial, uh, <laughs> denial is when you will not face the truth. It's um, kind of borders on positive thinking religions. If you go to the doctor and the doctor says you have cancer, Faith is not saying, I don't have cancer. There's no cancer there. There's no cancer there. That's not faith. Faith is not denial. Faith is not denying the attack. 
Faith is proclaiming the victory. Faith is saying, I walk in health and healing. By his stripes I have been healed. See, we, we've got to see ourselves not as the sick trying to get well. We must see ourselves as the well with symptoms of being sick that the devil's trying to put on us, and we rebuke them. Do you, do you see the difference? This one always makes somebody raise an eyebrow, so everybody just raise your left eyebrow right now so we won't know who it is that's raising their eyebrows. The Word of God says that faith is calling those things that be not as though they are. It's not, see, and people get this confused, faith is not calling those things that are as though they be not. Do you see the difference? Faith is calling those things that be not as though they are. It's not calling those things that are as though they be not. That's denial. So we say, by his stripes I have been healed. I am calling that thing that is not as though it is, and I'm giving no ground, no credibility to the pit. Now, I don't know about you, but if, if I was thrown in a pit many years ago, probably um, I, would, I would have probably prayed like this. Oh, God. Oh, God, I love you. God, I'm in the pit. Oh, it's bad pit, God. <laughs> oh, God, I'm so glad you don't have to be here and go through what I'm going through. Oh, God, it smells. <laughs> and Silas, he smells too. <laughs> and it hurts. Oh, God, it hurts. But I love you. I love you, God. But it hurts so bad, God. Oh, God, and Silas, he looks so hurt. He's hurt worse than I am, I think. I could just trade places with him. Oh, God, help me out, God. Oh, God. Now, you know what that does? Absolutely nothing. We are told we are to walk in authority. We are to rebuke the enemy. We talk to God like God doesn't know what's going on. You know, you go to a prayer meeting and sometimes are, all they are is people use prayer as an excuse to tell everybody else in the room how bad things are in their life. You know, I don't, I, you know, the preacher says I can't talk about how bad things are to you because, you know, when you're in a pit, you don't complain. So let's pray. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, God. I can't tell them, but I can tell you. You know, and it just doesn't work that way. We can't use prayer as an excuse to have a pity party. All right. Sometimes people say, well, what do I do, you know? Well, the scripture says, having done all that you know to do, you stand. You don't give up. You don't quit before the suddenly. When is your suddenly going to take place? How many in here would like a suddenly other than me? All right. I, I want a suddenly in my life. When's it gonna happen? Here's the answer when God wants it to happen. How long am I supposed to hang in there, believing in faith for my suddenly? Until the earthquake, until, until the suddenly happens. When's that gonna be? Once again, I don't know. Well, why don't you? Because I'm not God. God has a plan for us, and we need to choose his timing. Today is the day to choose and accept God's timing in our life. See, I, I think probably one of the main points I want to get to you tonight is this. God is in the process. If you have asked God in faith for deliverance, and you've, you've spoken over the circumstances, and you're holding your head high in confidence, and you know what God has told you, then your deliverance, if you haven't received it yet, is on its way. Your deliverance is on its way. And I, and I say to the church, 
Don't give up before it gets here. It's not so much whether God's going to deliver you or when. It's more, are you going to hang in there in faith, sing hymns, praise God, and continue until deliverance? Last night in Branson, I heard the story of a man who God spoke to his heart one time in a meeting, and, and the Spirit of God said, you know, you, <laughs> you need to start tithing. You know, you're believing me for deliverance in your finances, but you've got to start trusting me. And the man started tithing, and his business prospered for two years. His business just prospered beyond anything. And then he hit the third year, and the third year the business didn't do so well. And so he just decided to quit tithing. If you tithe and continue to tithe because of the money you see coming in, then you're tithing because of what you see and not out of obedience. Are you following me? Let me give you some scriptures. Luke 9, 51. Now it came to pass when the time had come for him, Jesus, to be raised up, that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. When did Jesus go to Jerusalem? When it was time. Not before, not after. Romans 5, 6. When we were still without strength, in due time, in God's timing, Christ died for the ungodly. Why did he die when he died? Because of the time. It was time. 1 Peter 5, 6 and 7 says, Therefore humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Now that, that due time phrase there means specific moed, appointed time, God's appointed time. Casting all your care upon him. So the scripture says you humble yourself in the sight of God and he exalts you. He lifts you up. He puts you where, where you're supposed to be. When does he do it? In his timing. When's his timing? Whenever it is. Well, what if I can't wait that long? Then you won't be lifted up. Why not? Because you didn't hang in for his due time. God has always been a God of timing. In Genesis 18, 12, it says, Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I have grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord, being old also? And the Lord, Jehovah, said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Surely shall I bear a child since I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time I will return to you, according to the time of life and Sarah shall have a son. See, Abraham and Sarah thought that the way things looked, they were too old to have a child. They thought it was impossible to have a child. But God said, it has nothing to do with man's timing, it has all to do with my timing, and in the appointed time, the child will come. In Numbers 9-2, it says, let the children of Israel keep the Passover at it's appointed time. God is a God of timing. Jesus said, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand. See, we're living in this framework of time. And we all want to be out of the pit. Agreed? No, oh, okay, well, we can just... <laughs> Hang out in the pit a little bit. You know, that's, that's another point, really. Some people enjoy the pit. Have you ever met somebody that enjoyed the pit? Um, Loretta and I knew this lady who, she always had this certain thing wrong with her. Always had this certain thing wrong. And every time we would get around her, she would tell us about this thing that was wrong. In fact, she spent a lot of time every day on the phone talking with all of her friends about the thing that was wrong 
in her life. To the point where after a few years went by, all of her friendships were built and all of her discussions were built, all of her amusement, everything was built on this thing that was wrong in her life. To the point that she really didn't want to get rid of it because if she did, she would lose the connection she had with all of her friends. That's not good. All right. How can I adjust myself so that I will submit myself to God's timing? I'm going to give you some points, all right? They're going to be quick. There's only 40. No, we'll, we'll break them down a little less than that. I'm going to be real quick. Number one, you've got to know his word. If, if you want to operate in God's timing, you've got to know his word. You know what? You've got to know what he says about whatever it is that's a problem in your life. If the problem's finances, you need to know what his word says about finances. If the problem's physical, you need to know what the word says about physical. See, we, we need to know that 1 Peter 2.24 says, by his stripes we have been healed. If you know that, then that's your first step in getting out of the sickness and disease pit, is knowing what his word says about healing. Number two, You've got to spend time in communication and prayer with God. You actually need to have some fellowship, some communication with God. What was Paul and Silas doing? They were singing hymns, praising, and what? Praying. They were communicating with God. Now, communicating with God isn't just coming up with a good idea and then in prayer saying, Dear God, bless my idea. You know, I've got, a, I've got a way all figured out for me to get out of the pit. And God, I've written it all down and here's the plan. Bless it, please. Bless my plan. Bless my plan because i got it all figured out, God. No, God is saying, let's talk and let me give you my plan. The plan comes down from the top. All right? Don't, in this communication, you'll also get rid of predetermined timing. Okay. Number three, spend time in worship. Now here's where a lot of people miss it because worship is not just going to church. Every worship service is not a worship service. Sometimes it's just a service. I was at a meeting last night and uh, there was a, a worship team that, uh, that got up and they had huge, big overheads on either side, you know, graphics and everything. It was beautiful. And um, with this worship team, they were singing a song that I didn't know. And so I was looking up at the, at the overheads, and I was doing my best to pick up the melody. Now, I'm a, from the past, I'm kind of like a musician. So I understand, I, you know, I, I minored in music in, at Southwest Baptist University. I took music theory and those kinds of things. So I, I understand notes a little, not as much as him, but just a little bit, okay. Now, so here I am, I'm watching the words up there, I'm hearing the musicians sing, and oh, it's a song I don't know, so I'm kind of trying to figure it all out. And about halfway through the second verse, the worship leader gets out there and starts preaching while we're singing and, and starts saying, oh, don't you love Jesus? Everybody love Jesus. Does everybody love, come on, does everybody? And I just tell you right now, we gotta, we gotta give a, and they started going into this stuff. Well, the worship team's still singing, okay? So I'm out here, you know, and I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, Am I, am I supposed to be singing the song or am I supposed to be listening? Are you following me? I'm thinking, am I, I'm trying to figure out what I'm supposed to do. I'm in a service. I'm a guest. I'm not, the, I'm, I'm not in charge of the meeting. I'm there. But I'm, I'm trying to figure out, am I supposed to sing with the worship team? Or am I supposed to listen to this person preach? Or am I supposed to do something based on what they're saying, which I can't really figure out what they're saying anyway, because the music's so loud and they're screaming in the microphone, it's all distorted. So what happened was, is after about an hour of that, 
Here's, here's, here's where it took me. I had a headache. <laughs> Is it okay? Is it okay for me to be honest? And so when they got done, you know, it was like to them, it was like, whoa, we had worship. Well, this worship team was not from the church that we were at anyway. It was a convention. You know what I'm saying? So maybe in their own church, everybody understood what was going on. But in the setting that we were in, probably hardly anybody in the building knew what was going on. Hardly anybody knew the songs that they had written at their church. That they sing at their church. Everybody at their church has got all memorized. But nobody at our, our convention has ever heard the songs, the words, or the melodies before. And we don't know if we're supposed to be, you know, because the person would stop and then they'd sing for a little bit and halfway through a sentence they'd start preaching again. And the next thing you know, after a while it's like, and so I'm thinking to myself, you know, what I really need to do is go out in the foyer, go down to the men's room, and maybe I could worship. Okay. Enough of my soapbox. Well, get off of it for a moment. But all I'm saying is this. Just because you go to church doesn't mean you worship. We, we must worship. See, sometimes you can worship more by yourself in your car, driving down the highway. Don't close your eyes and keep both hands on the wheel. But you can worship. Sometimes you can worship more in that setting, just you and God. Are you following me? And if we want to have God's handle on what we're supposed to do, see, God's got a plan to get out of the pit. God has a plan to get out of the pit. But we're not going to get out of the pit with our own plan. We've got to seek his plan, his timing, his plan. And that requires communication with him. Not pretend communication, not pretend worship. It's got to be real. It's got to be from your heart. All right? And then... The fourth thing is we've got to be led by the Spirit. If we're led by the head, if we're led by the flesh, if we're led by what other people say, if somebody else has got a witty idea, you know what? God may speak to somebody else and give them an idea that will set you free. But instead of just jumping on that idea as soon as you hear it, what you do is you take that idea before God. And you say, God, this, you know, I, I had no idea how to get out of this pit. And, and my friend, we were just talking, and this is what they said. Father, is, is, that, is that it? And you know what? God can speak to you and pour peace into your heart. And it may be that your answer will come through some wise counsel of someone. But don't just take the counsel. Take the counsel that they give you to God. Are you following me? All right. Be led by the Spirit. And number five, this is the last one. We've got to have faith in God. We've got to trust him. See, when Paul and Silas were in prison, probably the key thing right there is they trusted him. And if, if you trust, if you can trust, then all fear will be gone. See, trust and faith in the Greek are the same word. To have faith in God, even some Bibles translate it this way. In, uh, in the New Testament, the word faith in the Greek is used 200 and 12 times, two times in the Old Testament, 212 times in the New Testament. But faith and trust are the same thing. You, you cannot step out in what you call faith if you don't totally trust God. Trusting God is totally believing what he says, completely, 100%. So much that you can jump into the Father's arms blindly and it just doesn't even matter. I'll close with this illustration. Uh, back about uh, probably 10 years ago, I was watching a, uh, a little kid, probably, I don't know, it's kind of tough to judge ages, what would you say, probably two, little kid, uh, old enough, uh, probably potty trained, but, uh, but not going to school yet, toddler, well, preschool, preschool. Are we settled in on the age yet? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes I can get over analytical. You know, I remember one time I was on a cruise ship, and this guy fell off, and I leaned over the edge and started giving him the molecular composition of the water, of the molecules, and the... <laughs> no, I didn't do that. Um, okay. But this, this little kid was standing on the table, standing... The, the father had set this kid up on, like, a kitchen table, and he says, jump. And the little kid just kind of, like, 
leaned forward about six or eight inches and the father caught the kid and he set the kid back up and he says, all right, now just come here. And the kid starts leaning over and the father catches, comes up and catches the kid, you know. Father says, okay, now. And he backs up four or five feet. Go ahead. This kid had total confidence in his dad. Total confidence. The kid just goes. And the kid was just falling off the table because every time the kid would fall off, the father would run up there and get the kid and the kid would laugh, you know, and the dad had set the kid back up on the table. Well, what had happened is the dad had got about five or six feet away and he, he did it. He caught the kid and the kid laughed and he stood the kid back up on the table. Well, the dad was done. You, you know what I'm saying? The, the dad was done. And so he just got distracted. He just turned and started to walk away and he got like six or seven feet away and somebody yelled because the kid was over there going, <laughs> Are you following me? Now, even though the father had turned his back and he was walking away, the child had such confidence, they were never going to hit that floor. Dad, it doesn't matter if dad's even looking. Dad's going to catch me. And I've often thought about that. The father's arms. If we could be that way with God. You know, Jesus said it unless we come as little children. Little children have that kind of faith. They'll just, dad'll get me, <laughs> and they'll just drop on over. We have to look at everything. Measure the distance from the floor. Measure the distance, you know, how long is it gonna take him to turn around? Will he hear me? We just need to be like children and trust in him. And when we're in the pit, we say, we praise you, Father. We love you. Sing hymns, pray, and have no, give no thought to what's around us. But see what's around us that he says is around us. He says, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. He says, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. He says, no weapon formed against you will prosper. He says for you, all things are, are, are possible. All things are possible. To him that believes, all things are possible to him that believes. Is it possible you can get out of that pit? Yes, it's possible. Is it possible for everybody? No, because Jesus, Jesus didn't say, for everyone it's possible to get out of the pit, for everyone. No, he said, to him that believes, all things are possible, to him that believes. What's my job? My job, defined in Ephesians 4.11, is to teach the saints so that the saints can do the work of the ministry. What am I supposed to teach you? I'm supposed to teach you this, that if you can believe, all things are possible. If you can believe. Believe what? what he said. What did he say? You fall, I'll always be there to catch you. No weapon formed against you will prosper. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. The enemy has been defeated. Start living with what I've paid for. He paid the price. Stand up. He's paid the price completely for health. Excuse it. I'm not going to say that anymore. I'm not going to say excuse me. I'm going to quit apologizing for what Jesus died for. He died, took stripes, and did the work so that we could have health, wealth, and good relationships and peace and joy. He's paid the price and he wants us to walk in what he's already paid for. Father, in the name of Jesus, we praise your holy name. We love you, we magnify you. We thank you, Father, that your word is true. We speak blessings upon these, your people. We thank you, Father, amen. God bless you all, we love you.
Down the road to Jerusalem. 